Welcome to Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report for February 2015. Dress Rehearsal for the Arsenal of Democracy. I'm your host, Dennis Kupinski. Today we will watch a lecture by Chris Cosley from Michigan's Military, Technical, and Historical Society Museum that he presented on January 7th at the Yankee Air Museum. On February 8, 1915, D.W. Griffith's silent film, Birth of a Nation, opens at the Clune Auditorium in Los Angeles, the first 12-reel film in America. On February 10, President Wilson warns Germany that they will be held strictly accountable for all property endangered and lives lost. He also warned Great Britain not to fly U.S. flags on British merchant ships to deceive German submarines. This was done on the Lusitania earlier this month. On February 22nd, Germany begins unrestricted submarine warfare. On February 20th, the Panama Pacific International Exposition opens in San Francisco. On February 7, 1915, the Second Battle of the Masurian Lakes took place in present-day Poland. The German army had surrounded a Russian army. On February 21st, the entire Russian corps surrendered. But the Russians had stopped the German offensive in the north, preventing Germany from entering far into Russia. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I, I am actually a Yankee Air Museum life member that uh, was active here in the past. Uh, I kind of left and formed my own little organization a few years back. Uh, we were doing the Michigan Military Technical and Historical Society. Uh, we focus on uh, Michigan's contribution to 20th century conflict, uh, so Michigan in defense of democracy. Uh, we talk about uh, the role Michigan played in basically from 1900 through today. Located in East Point right off a nine and a half mile in Gratiot. So what made the United States stand out in a, at that point in time? We had what was called the American system of, of production. It, it was, you know, as, as the definition says up here, the uniform production of items made interchangeable components allowing manufacture with relatively unskilled labor. So we were able to build things in large quantities without a skilled craftsman workforce. You know, a lot of people refer to this as Fordism. You know, despite what popular culture says, Ford didn't actually invent the assembly line. He perfected it. He, he marketed it to the point where, you know, where it kind of became associated with him. But in reality, you know, Eli Whitney, Samuel Colt, Isaac Singer, McCormick, all of these guys had major roles in it. So what was the origin of mass production? That was kind of interesting. The origin of mass production, you know, given the fact that the United States at that point in time was not a military power, the origin was actually military. The, uh, the, American, the Ordnance Department in the 1800s began looking for ways to make muskets cheaper and make them repairable in the field. And in the 1840s, they uh, really began to work on this prior to the 1840s, 1830s, right around your Mexican-American War. By the time the Civil War came around, we were producing weapons that, were that had a relatively high interchange rate, and a lot of the European countries were sending their military attachés over here to study what we were doing. They didn't pay attention to what happened during the Civil War. If they would have paid attention to what, the, what happened at the end of the Civil War, especially on Petersburg, World War I might have looked different, but they didn't really pay attention to the, to the tactics, but they definitely paid attention to our production capability and how we made things. Because the auto industry was centered here in the, around the state of Michigan and around the Detroit area in particular, we had a lot of casting and machining capability. So you got Henry Ford, he's kind of an interesting character. Uh, they call him the fighting pacifist. When the United States enters World War I, President Wilson summons him, calls, brings him to Washington. But his country's at war, and he says, well, I'm at war, and I'm 
behind it and want to support my country. So the United States, we had, th we were facing this new thing, the submarine warfare, and we had a great shortage of ships. And one of the ships that we really needed was anti-submarine capability. And uh, they wanted Ford to apply his knowledge of mass production to shipbuilding. And, uh, and like it says here, the Navy was looking at 21 s different kinds of anti-submarine warfare ship at that point in time. And Ford was like, well, rather than building small quantities of 21, why don't we make large quantities of one? So we have the Eagle boat. So in January 1918, the Ford Water Company accepted the contract to build between 100 and 500 sub-chasers. And then we had a Navy design, you know, 200 feet long, 615 ton. And one of the important things to note, this, the ship itself was not designed by Ford. It was designed by the Navy. And then Ford made modifications to the design to, uh, to make it mass producible. So one of the big things he did was to recommend that hulls be made from, from flat steel plates as opposed to rolled steel, which was the common for shipbuilding at the time. So, uh, Ford had built this little parcel of land over on the this Rouge River, over not far from where we're at now. And uh, actually, for those of you who are familiar with the Rouge, the first building at the Rouge was built for the production of the Eagle Boats. Ford got the government to dredge the river. I mean, he, so he, he kind of cashed in. He, he used government money to kind of prep the land and build the slips and dredge the river. And so he was, he was thinking ahead. He wasn't, the man, was, the man wasn't dumb. He was a little bit nutty, but he wasn't dumb. So the contract was signed, and work on the hulls began at the Highland Park plant, and they shuttled back and forth. But it's very much a foreshadowing of the bomber plant that we have, you know, just behind us or behind or over here, is that the plant was being built, and product was being built in the plant, and things were coming out of the plant before it was done. So you really kind of had this is your your lesson. You know, that this is your dress rehearsal. You know, they're, they're learning important important facts here. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Eagle Boat never made it into combat. Uh, Eagle Boats 1 and 2 were accepted by the Navy prior to the armistice on the 11th of uh, November. Uh, shortly after the armistice, uh, 3 and 4 were signed well, on the 14th, so three days after the armistice. Uh, even though none of the boats saw action in combat, it was a remarkable feat. You know, in, like, you know, in 11 months, Ford took a design, he adapted it to mass production, built the assembly facility, and managed to produce four ships. I mean, a traditional, like, like we're saying up here, a traditional shipbuilder would have barely laid a keel in that time frame. So the United States was the birthplace of powered flight. But after that, we kind of took a back seat and the Europeans ran with it. The Europeans took off and they ran with the whole idea. And the outbreak of World War One, they capitalized on the military potential of aircraft. I mean, we were, I mean, we had the Jenny, you know, a couple of Mexicans took a couple of pot shots at a Jenny, you know, chasing Pancho Villa. That was the full extent of our combat aircraft capability. Uh, and they, they were on the receiving end of the gunfire. So the United States military aviation was, was pretty sad. Uh, it was relegated to being a section of the Signal Corps. And when we entered the war in 1917, 52 officers, 1,100 or less than 200. Uh, it's near and dear to my heart because I am a government civilian employee. Uh, so one, there were 200 of my fellow civilian civilians working in the Air Corps at that time. And there were 26 certified pilots. So we decided that we were going to go to war in European designs. And uh, the United States was going to manufacture aircraft that, that, that were primarily for training. Uh, the, the SPADs and, the, and those aircraft, that, you know, like the SPAD you guys had, those were all built overseas. And they were given to the Americans to fight with. What we built here were aircraft that were relegated primarily to training. Not all of them, though. We'll talk about that in a second. So the focus would be on the on the two models, uh, the Curtis JN4, our infamous Jenny, and the De Havilland DH4, which would eventually be repowered with the Liberty engine. And we'll talk about the Liberty in a little bit. So you had the American you know, Dayton Wright aircraft, Fisher body, right here in Detroit, 
and Standard Aircraft Company would build, you know, 4,846. Uh, 1213, 12, so 12, just about 1,200 of them were actually shipped to Europe and may have seen some combat action. And so what's kind of interesting is the, we made 4,800 DH-4s in a period of about 18 months. The De Havilland Aircraft Company produced 1449 for the entire war. So American production, there's a reason why everybody was watching what, what we did. So DH-4, so this is a photograph, this is actually taken at the Fisher Body uh, plant down at, right in downtown Detroit. There are 15 different furniture companies that combined their efforts and, were, and built 365 Handley Page 0400 bombers. Uh, the entire aircraft, with the exception of the engine, was manufactured in Grand Rapids. And uh, several of the O400s were shipped to England, but none were assembled in time to see action. So, most of the things that, it, when I did the preliminary research for this, most of it, the documentation I found focused primarily on the, the DH4s and the, J, and the JN4s. But it wasn't until recently that I stumbled across, and this is information that came from the Grand Rapids uh, Library, is so that there's. This is something that there was more stuff to be found. Uh, to go back briefly to the uh, to the DH4, there were 1,600 DH4s that were built here in Detroit at the Fisher Body Plant. So of that, 4,000 1,600 were built here. Uh, one of the interesting things is, in these were these may or may not have been, uh, you know, American-built aircraft, but at the end of the war in 1918. That the surviving De Havilland DH-4s in Europe were all brought together into one location in France, and they were all set on fire. And it got the nickname with the Europeans as the Billion Dollar Bonfire. So they, they gathered them all into one place and they torched them. So aviation engines is another area where, we, where the United States was definitely, and this is a, a place where we really made an impact. So. You can kind of see here the British are developing 37 different kind of engines. The French had 46 different engines. The Germans had eight different engines. None of these engines could be classified as outstanding. They were average at best. So engines, they, they were still very much a craftsman society. The Engines were assembled, the, the parts were made in, to rough specifications and everything was lovingly hand fit together by highly trained craftsmen and machinists and it took a mammoth amount of time to build them. They, the, the Europeans came to us prior to the American entry into the war and were asking us to build their engine, very, very much like we would see with the, with, uh, the Packard and the, uh, the Merlin in World War II. They came, to, they came to us and to the American car companies and said, hey, we need engines, can you build them for us? And much like you saw with the Merlin, we had the same problem. They, they sent us blueprints, and the blueprints were just I, 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 unclear specifications. There, I, there are cases, uh, there was one case where I read on the Daron, on the Daron engine, where they called out a material for the crankshaft that was clearly incorrect because the uh, the American the engineers would say if you made a crankshaft out of that it would it would fail in 20 seconds, you know they had the the incorrect callouts, vague sizes, so they they realized that the best thing we can do, and this kind of sounds familiar those familiar with the Packard story with the Merlin, it'd be a lot easier just to go ahead, go over to Europe get an engine, bring it over here, tear it down, and reverse engineer it. So that's what they would do. But that takes time. It takes a lot of time. Especially you think back in 1914, there's no CAD. There's, you know, everything's done by hand. You know, this is a very time-consuming process. So one example, the Hispano Suiza, I, don't pronounce, I always pronounce that wrong, don't I? But it took 13 months to uh, to reverse engineer it. It took eight months to reverse engineer the Lerone. So the United States government does something intelligent. This, this group, no, no gasps. No. <laughs> the United States government does something relatively smart. They're like, you know what? We need to develop an engine. We need to make one engine. We need to make 
a good, not a good, we need to make a great engine. You know, we have the technology. It's a Lee Majors thing, isn't it? We can make it better, stronger, faster. Yeah, that's right. So the United States government goes out and they pick probably two of the smartest guys that, that, that you can find. They go out onto the west coast and they grab a guy named E.J. Hall, who was part of Hall Scott Motor. Anybody here familiar with Hall Scott? If you're, if you're a marine engine person, you'll know Hall Scott. They, they were the standard for marine engines for most of the, the 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, the outstanding engines. So you have E.J. Hall, probably one of the smartest guys on, in the, on the planet as far as engine design. And then they go grab another guy named Jesse Vincent, who people in this area will probably know. He was from Packard Motor Car Company. Uh, Jesse Vincent, another genius. Uh, things on the car today that you take for granted all came out of that man's head. So this guy was, he, and he had been working on the Packard V12s, and he had been at working on the Packard aviation engine programs prior to this. So they take Hall and Vincent and, and a couple of French aviation advisors. Now, it's, I always find it funny, I talk, when, we, when we go through this presentation, today everybody kind of makes fun of the French. You know, in the military, you know, the French rifle you know, only dropped once, blah, 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 blah. If, this, if you really look at this, and we'll, especially later when we get into the armaments, the French were the industry leaders at that time. They were the state of the air. They were the innovators. So we have some French aviation advisors, and we got Hall and Vincent and this uh, Colonel Deeds. Uh, he probably pulled the short straw. And uh, in May 1917, they take him to a suite at the Willard Hotel in Washington, and they, they basically lock him in. And they're like, you guys need to develop us an engine. They decided to develop a family of engines that could be built as either 4, 6, 8, or 12s and the common design interchangeable components. They were, Colonel Deeds was given, uh, I'll say he was given the key to the Bureau of Standards and Patents and nothing was off the table. So they were, they said, Beg, steal whatever technology you want from other companies. They even went to some some of the enemy designs. The only thing they were told was nothing experimental. We want you to take current technology. We want you to take the best of today's technology and combine it into one engine. So they took the crankshaft from you know one company. I know they they I, I think they took the camshaft designs from BMW. There's actually a really good book on the Liberty engine. It's it's about this thick, and because uh, we could you could talk for weeks about the Liberty, and you have to remember, okay, May 1917 they go in, and by June they had a design. <coughs> so I remember it took them eight months to reverse engineer that goofy Laron engine, and in you know four to six weeks they have designed and they have come up with a with a design. They come back here to Detroit and they borrow 300 drafts. And remember, you know, we have no, no computers, no CAD, no CAM. They go out and this is all hand-drawn stuff. They, they go out and they get 300 draftsmen from all the car companies, you know, Packard, Cadillac, Pierce, Arrow, and they put them in a room and they say, okay, here's the engine, we're going we're gonna to draw it, we're going to design it. And the first eight-cylinder prototype was delivered on July 4th. So May, June, July from paper to running prototype in two months. So then they decided that they would center production of this engine in the Detroit area and every single major auto company was involved in the production of it. Uh, we'll talk a little, this was a different, it was a different mindset at that time. The idea wasn't to have one company build a whole product. They would, they would, each, different companies would build different components, and the government would assemble them. Was sort of the was the idea that they were running with it. Most of these were actually built as complete assemblies. Different companies build. You could have one company just build crankshafts, send them to a government arsenal, and they could assemble them. It didn't really happen that way, but that was the concept. So production numbers. They built two four cylinders. They weren't very really popular. 52 six cylinders, 15 eight cylinders, 20,478 12 cylinders. 
and there's our Ford data plate. There's, there's old Hap, the very first V12 delivered. This, is, this engine changed a, a lot of things, and it was truly an outstanding engine. So, I mean, we, we succeeded. Did, it, did a lot of them make it into combat? Not really, but we actually succeeded in what we were, what we set out to do. Remember, the United States was only in World War One for 18 months, so a lot of the stuff was still on the boats. And what's interesting is, I, I believe it was Gar Wood w wanted Ford built ones because he said the Ford built ones were better. He said Ford quali the Ford built ones were better quality. So Gar Wood, for his racing applications, would all, would seek out Ford built ones. As we say, as, as was the case of the airplane, the United States was like was woefully behind the curve. We were, yeah, we were totally outpaced. Uh, so we decided to adopt the, the French 75, 155, 240, and then the British 9.2 inch gun. Uh, important note, the French 75 changed the face of warfare. Now a lot of people, right, how many people, we'll do a little quick poll, World War I, trench warfare, what caused it? How many people here put the, say the machine gun? Nobody? Right, one in the back. How many people say it was artillery? Yeah, see what well, well, he knows. World War One was an artillery war, and the French 75 was the reason why. 1897, though those crazy French, never been fired, only dropped once, guys, developed a 75 millimeter field gun that would absolutely, positively change the way war would be fought. They created this thing called the recuperator. Uh, I, and I won't ask you what a recuperator does because it's right up there on the screen. Recuperator absorbs the firing force of the weapon. Now, prior to this, you had the guns when you fired them, and you've probably all seen the pirate movies with all the rope tied around, and they fire the gun, and they go scattering, <coughs> skittering across the deck, or you've seen the Civil War guns where they fire them, and you know, the round goes that way, and the gun goes that way. The recuperator changed that. It allowed you to fire, to lay a gun and fire round after round after round without relaying the gun. Yeah, artillery, I'm using artillery terms here, you know, laying the gun means, right? But you don't have to relay the gun all the time. You could play, position your gun, you could sight it in, and you could fire it. And you could get round after round on target with a, relative, with a high rate of fire, a high rate of accuracy. That is what drove World War One into a stag into a stagnant. Well, the machine gun probably didn't help either, but our, the artillery definitely did. See, so we got these these crazy guys called the Dodge Brothers. They had just recently left uh, left Old Henry and split off on their own to start their own company, 1914. So they're they're looking to put a name for themselves. So once again, we have the same situation. The, the French built recuperators one at a time, lovingly hand fit them, you know. The Dodge brothers took on, were the ones who took the task of making the recuperator mass producible. They did both the 75 and the 155, uh, and they built the plant and very, very kind of very much like we see with Willow Run, government owned, contractor operated, government funded, you know and they built the plant in Detroit specifically for the 155 recuperator. And by the end of the war, they were making them at about 17 a day. At the end of the war, we had, we had four tube making, you know, four facilities we were capable of making a gun tube. Uh, I, bring, I put this one in here just because there was, an, once again, another case, government owned, contractor operated, government funded construction by Chakas Manufacturing in downtown Detroit that was making the uh, three-inch anti-aircraft gun. So once again, we have the you have these government arsenals. One of them happens to have been built here in Detroit that were making the gun tubes. But once again, the car companies come in and they start make they look at parts of the artillery and say a lot of this stuff isn't very different from cars, and especially with the caissons and the the limbers and, and the shot trucks and things like that. So they begin producing those components 
out of auto plants. Uh, when, like we said earlier with the hand grenade bodies, auto companies had foundry capability and machining capability. So it was, a, it was not that difficult for these companies to go from casting engine blocks to casting artillery shells. So actually motorized transport is one of the areas where the United States was not behind the curve. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the, uh, we had actually dabbled with motor cars in the punitive expedition and uh, the first documented test of a vehicle by the U.S. Army was done in, in uh, 1904. Uh, but it was not until 1912 that we really began looking at it seriously. Liberty trucks. This was another one of those cases where the idea was not to have one company make the vehicle, it was to have a standardized design where components could be made by multiple companies, shipped to a government arsenal and assembled. Didn't, it, it, it was a novel, it was a noble concept, but it didn't work real well. So in 1914, the government really starts looking at a vehicle, and they, ha they gather all these really smart people together, and they start designing a vehicle. You know, they get Packard, Page, General Motors. They all come together, and they design the truck, and they come up with, uh, they come up with the Liberty trucks. So you have the standard A and standard Bs these two standard trucks and everything's wonderful but meanwhile back in the real world you know Washington's running around in circles designing this truck meanwhile you have the army the military at that point in time was was really a, it was a mess you you didn't have a standardized ordering system you had everybody was doing their own thing the aviation branch the quartermaster branch the ordnance branch signal corps they're all they all have their own supply lines, they have their own governing bodies, they're placing orders, they're, you know, they're, they're, making, they're competing against each other, they're, ma they're making a mess. But you have, you know, this, they're up there, the, yeah, U.S. Army had over 200 makes of vehicles in their service, both domestic and foreign, and it, it, the supply system was, it was such a disaster that a vehicle broke, you would just kind of leave it and go steal another one somewhere. 1917, we went into the war. We had, you know, 3,000 trucks, you know, 400 motorcycles. Boom. End of the war. 85,000 trucks alone. And unlike World War II, civilian production did never stopped during the war. So we, we pulled that off, making both military and civilian. Like we see in the conclusion here, the United States was involved 18, in World War I for 18 months. And so a lot of the stuff didn't make it over there, but it was a valuable, valuable tool. Because you got a lot of guys you, you see in World War I. You got this, this little, what was he, uh, assistant secretary of the Navy named Roosevelt. You know, he may have been in the corner taking notes. And you had Bernie Baruch and all these guys that come back around. You know, they all, they learned, that they, they, they had a valuable teaching tool here. One of the things that, that, I like to kind of point out too is that when World War One ended, the United States government went to all these companies. So you see all this this incredible work that was done. The United States went to these companies and said, "War is over. Contracts are canceled," and they stopped payment. And you had so you see like those caissons lined up at you know it, and if they if they hadn't been delivered yet, the government was like, "Yeah, we don't need those anymore. You can uh, whatever." And it created this deep-rooted distrust of the government with, with industry that would come back to haunt us in World War II. And you also had this headhunting campaign that went on at the end of World War I where the, where the people, where the shift back to isolationism, where we looked and said, well, you know, these, these companies made blood money. They got rich off of this weapons of, of, of war and destruction and, you know, the money has blood on it. And they went on this campaign to basically to, to demonize all of these people that had stepped up to the plate and delivered. And then they also made it to the point where with the tax laws at the time, you couldn't idle a plant. You, you paid the same amount of taxes on a facility if it was producing stuff as you did as if it was sitting idle. So you had like, on the East Coast, you had the steel mills that were created to, to meet the war demand. You had the, like we talked about the, uh, the gun tube plant here in Detroit. 
You'll find nothing of that after the war. Because the minute the war was over, these companies went in and they bulldozed everything. They, they tore it down, they tore it, they bulldozed it because they did, the government was like, we're not going to give you any more money. We're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to even honor the contract we signed with you. We're paying for what you delivered. Anything else is, it's your problem. The press and, oh yeah, by the way, we're going to tax the pants off of you on all this stuff that you built. So, I mean, they, they tore the stuff down, they bulldozed it. And when World War II comes around, a lot of people, you know, I'll do my little soapbox for a second. A lot of people today are like, oh, you know, if we had to do it again today, we couldn't because all of our industrial capability has been shipped to India or whatever. We did the same thing at the end of World War I. We did it to ourselves, though. We didn't ship it off to another country. We taxed it to the point where the companies just tore it down. So we went into World War I or World War II at a serious disadvantage because of some of the stuff that was done here. And uh, that, that's a whole, that's a whole other point, of, you know, a whole other case study. And I, I know I'm running along here, so we won't, we won't go into that. And, you know, but that, that's an area of study that, that people really should look at because it's, it's, you know, it's kind of crazy. But it's what the American people wanted. Yes, they never exactly. Wanted to fight a war again, if we had no weapons, we could never fight it. Precisely. What's that tune I hear? So what do they do? They came here, and they purchased 200 prefabricated cedar wood homes from the Aladdin Company. In, uh, in Bay City. Now those of you, Aladdin was a big prefab company. That was a big thing at that time, the prefab houses. You could buy them from Sears and Munga Pre Wars and things like that. So it was, yeah, the cost of the order in place in 1916. And the houses were shipped across. Now there were two loads shipped across. One load was torpedoed and sank. So somewhere at the bottom of the North Atlantic there's an entire village. <laughs> and, uh, but the other one made it. And on November 1917, the house, you know, so another great one, you know, December 1916 to November 1917, they had placed the order, shipped them across the ocean, and put them up. And today we'd still be fighting with the EPA and OSHA. So, the and fact that we were able to do what we did in World War II is, is just a testament to the, well, it's a testament to what a nation can do when you, when you really kind of tick them off.